Dr. Kelly Elizabeth Wright. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so thrilled to have you here. Hi. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Yes, of course. Um, so yeah, so we met at the Linguistic Society of America's annual meeting, and immediately it just became clear to me that everyone was talking about this postdoc, this this woman, Dr. Kelly Elizabeth Wright. She is the person, right? You're being referenced by everyone as the person who's doing the sociolinguistic work that needs to be done. So please introduce yourself. Tell the world who you are and what you do and why you do it and what you're about. Hi, thank you so much. I um I am Dr. Kelly Elizabeth Wright. <laughs> I'm an experimental sociolinguist and lexicographer. And my work is broadly focused on understanding the creation and maintenance of linguistic ideology, both over time and in real time, um, for a fun, full-throated answer. Um, uh, experimental sociolinguistics. Sociolinguistics is the branch of linguistics that's most interested with social forces, how they're formed and how they work in language. And the experimental part means that I bring people into the lab to answer those questions instead of like looking at primary texts or working with corpora or doing other things, right? Um, and then a lexicographer is um, a word mapper, <laughs> somebody who puts words in the dictionary. So that's like my other big job, which I really love. And to me is, you know, the, the work there is part of understanding creation of <laughs> ideology maintenance over time and in real time. So it's it's a lot of fun. And yeah, it was wonderful to meet you. I've never been um, in one of these spaces where I actually have had seen the person in real life. So this is a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been so interested in this idea that you're kind of experimental sociolinguist and also lexicographer and all these other things. And that's really cool, especially because I feel like linguists often hate the concept of a word. And yet <laughs> there you are working with words, which kind of makes you um, interesting in, in that in that sense. Um, but what I feel like has really drawn me to your research in general has just been this consistent uh, can, I, you're talking all the time about so word, big words that might not make a lot of sense, like sociolinguistic labor and linguistic justice and just usage and ideas that are like, sometimes I could think, oh, this, maybe that's theoretical, but I don't know if it certainly is. So what are these key terms that you use and what do they mean? Where are we going here with just usage and linguistic, and linguistic oppression, right? What's that? Yeah. 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 Okay. So it's interesting because a lot of what I do sort of sits at the line in between what the public understands language to do and what linguistics is, and then also what linguistics is, what the organized study of language in a scientific manner looks like and can look like. Linguistic, there's a few a few key terms, right, that sit here. One of them, one of them that's interesting that you mentioned, and I want to get back to oppression and labor, of course. <laughs> Yay, my favorite things to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I want um, is like code switching. So I, I um, am very specific in my work. I talk about style shifting, but I also code switching is this thing that people people know that they do. Like people who are not linguists know exists. They translated into all forms of life, not just linguistics, like how you dress, how you walk, you know, um, even, even I've heard people say like the way they carry items. When, uh, this woman came up to me after a talk once and told me that um, her in-laws make her very nervous. <laughs> and so when she's like, when they're all getting out of the car or something to like go into a Denny's, she's always like picking up everyone's stuff, like carrying extra stuff. So like nobody has anything in their hands. I this is, she's like, I don't, it's like when you notice your, yourself on the phone with like a stranger, like an adult male, and like your voice goes up three octaves and you're like, who is she? Who is this woman who just spoke for the last 45 seconds? It's like that of like somehow some things in our lives just trigger this movement into a new, a different way of being. And it, it, it doesn't really have anything to do with oppression <laughs> on its face, right? It just has to do with what it means to inhabit an identity in the world. <laughs> so that's a big part of what I'm actually interested in is like doing self or, or what it means to just be a person <laughs> out in the world and why. And I'm, I think my big research question is, my big nerdy thing is, isn't that so cool? There's so much that we do. Look at all the wonderful ways we do it. Let's celebrate them. But then, you know, my, my scientific question is, why is it harder? for some people to exist and so, uh, than others. <laughs> and in, in, in certain situations, why is it very maybe very difficult for most people to exist like a courtroom 
Um, no, no one is comfortable in that space. And the language there is very unnatural and incredibly codified, right? There, we know there's a secret, but nobody really understands it, right? So it's it's something of like, what are these most uncomfortable spaces tell us? And what are these most comfortable spaces tell us? Linguistic oppression, what interests me, it, it, I didn't really realize that was what I was interested in at first. Because I didn't even realize linguistics is what I was interested in at first. <laughs> um, the first research project that I did that that led me into this field was about Ghanaian nationalism. So I very, yeah, see, it seems very out there. Um, but what I observed, like as an undergraduate, um, an undergraduate literature student in like a required, <laughs> you know, uh, history class was Kwame Nkrumah, this first president of Ghana, Ghana being this first African nation to wrest independence away from a colonial government, is speaking English. And he's it, everything that I was reading was not in translation in this class where we're reading like <laughs> lots of things in translation. Um, he's speaking English. And why? why? <laughs> like I, got, I went all the way to Ghana with this research question of what, why couldn't African pan-Africanism be done in in an African language, like it just didn't make sense. <laughs> and so this, this bigger question of like, why was the arena of like global politics, not a place for an African language? Why isn't, why aren't those languages represented? Why can't you put it on a stop sign? <laughs> those, <laughs> those questions are the same ones uh, fall under linguistic oppression. It turns out falls under linguistic oppression. So that, it, it's really no different than other forms of oppression. You know, certain ways of languaging are not preferred or allowed or appropriate or accepted or expected or valued in, in certain spaces. Those and those most important spaces being the ones that secure your freedom or your health care or your place to live um, or your right to leave the country um, or your right to enter the country. Uh, <laughs> so this is, yeah, linguistic oppression is just this language-based side of all the isms that we know. Yeah. I, I, I want to pick up on a lot of things you said there, but number one is very long this question <laughs> of why does she have to carry the baggage, right? There's that, right? There's a totally a metaphor in there. If she's carrying yep. their baggage, like she's picking up everyone's things, supporting everyone. Like I already, and the Marx system is it being <laughs> all this, like, women are, care, care, are picking up this laugh, right? But then also, you know, all these forms of oppression, whether it's linguistic or otherwise, I think come down to like a common, common frustration and common feelings and, and like not necessarily common, you know, ways of resolving them, but it's just, it's really interesting to think about like, right. Like it, it, these changes in behavior often come down to, to linguistic oppression, to oppression of language. Yeah. Well, and the common behavior really is part of it because I mean, yes, please bring up Marx. Let's talk about sociolinguistic yeah. labor because yeah. it is this is it is about valuing you know it, it okay we you can take like the most scientific um you know entry into this conversation by thinking about physics like we linguistic production is material <laughs> all material has value on the market right so it's like I, I physically actually produce a pressure wave to communicate speech you know i'm moving my hands i'm doing something i'm writing i'm, I'm pressing you know um, a triangle into a clay tablet, right? Like all of these things are creating material. So what that means is sociolinguistic labor then is the cost or the act of doing self in the world, of moving that material around and having it having it recognized as such. Because so Rusty Barrett, um, Brianna Cornelius, these folks are working on um, this thing, the, the paper is called You Met My Ambassador. And it's this idea of, I, there's, there's these three parts of self, like who I feel I am, what I show to people and what they see. So if you're a trans woman, <laughs> you're feeling that you are a female on the inside and you're trying to perform femininity for the world. And you are waiting for that moment where the world passively accepts you as an adult female back that it's not with an asterisk that you just get to inhabit femininity. So this is like having those three forms of self in alignment is really important. That's maybe something like a, 
using language in a state of rest, a labor-free state of usage, uncommodified language use is when you're feeling that all of those, those selves are, are working. When it's not in alignment, that's when language use feels more laborful. So fast forward this, fast forward then to conversations with professionals and asking them about how they, how they work what their work lives are like like not even saying how do you use language in these scenarios and nothing even that specific asking them just to observe what their professional lives are like many professionals from minoritized backgrounds or non-normative backgrounds people who have you know ability issues um etc things that things that aren't embodied in the way that we think of them traditionally uh they all report feeling like they have to shift their self for, in some way to exist in the workplace that it's either like I was saying like you're walking down the hallway and you see some you know some random man in your workplace and you're like hi Jim like hi, Jim like way too high <laughs> hi Jim hi. it's this thing of like I, who was that who is this yeah. woman that just jumped out of my mouth like I don't even I don't even know Jim he doesn't even work in my department like why did I feel compelled to say hello to him when your when your grandparents are around, you maybe aren't using profanity, you know, or taking the Lord's name in vain. Something that you feel comfortable doing in your own age group, but in around elders is like a way that you filter. That this is something that we all really understand. That again, like doesn't have anything to do necessarily with oppression. It just has to do with like what it means to be younger than someone else. <laughs> um, but when we get into looking at who does the most work out in the world, it ends up being the same people who are at the most risk in the world. I just, I, I'm just appreciating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true. And I think, I don't even know if there's any been, and been any kind of linguistic um, analysis into like what happens when we see someone that we like or have a crush on. Cause that's, that's a voice that jumps out of us. And like, we don't yeah. know who that is, but I know that there's like some idea. I think it's that like your voice is naturally gets a little bit more high pitched if you're a woman and a straight woman specifically. And I find that like, like weird. I like get like goosebumps in like a really annoying way. Like, Ooh, like the physiology of like being feminine, like, <laughs> like, Ooh, like, you know, yeah. or like what that sort of like triggers in your head, but it's, it's true. But I think like all of that is to is somehow this idea this presupposition that that to be more accepted in the workplace to Jim who's walking down the hallway or to be seen as uh more attractive you have to be this kind of like more feminine persona you have to project something that's closest to what the world would want you to be right, right. um and that obviously gets kind of fraught when you get into like well sometimes speaking that way in a job interview is actually going to get you the job um, as opposed to speaking a different way, but that's a really hard problem to reconcile. Yeah. Yeah. And then you get the job, then you get the job and you work right. for 40 years, you work yeah. for 40 years, sounding like a different woman at some point, do you become her? Like who, like, are you still you? I, that's, um, there's a story or, um, a study that I cite it's from, um, Jones and Shorter Gooden from 2003. These, they, they surveyed 300, black women at work um and these women talk about invisibility and like the only the way for me to be successful in this space is not to be seen but then what am I contributing to this space if I'm not visible here <laughs> um and the minute the minute I become visible like my livelihood is at risk so I really like none of the like you met my ambassador like none of these people know me so my, yeah, but they're also the people I spend the most time with. <laughs> so it's, a, it's such a, it's such a conundrum. Um, sorry, you said yeah. something and I'm like trying to, I can't, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> no, 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 you're good. Um, I kind of want to get to this, like, so, so I've been watching a lot of the um, talks that you've given at different like schools and conferences and things like that. And I am first off blown away by your speaking skills and the passion and all these other things. I mean, like truly, but secondly, you come at linguistic oppression from a really interesting angle. And it's a lot of times historical, right? Talking about literacy laws and like the actual legal historical precedents and the reason for which today we find linguistic oppression through like 
laws that try to oppress language as a proxy, of course, always for other things. It's never actually about, you know, language, it's about race, it's about class, it's about gender. So language literacy laws, what is going on with the suppression of literacy? Because that to me feels like a suppression of power and a suppression of equal opportunity, especially yeah. if we're talking about the economics of it all. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for asking this. Thank you for asking this. Because, okay, I did the historical focus of this work a lot or my work in general a lot of there I do it for two reasons one of them and you had a guest Nicole Holiday on here she she talked about this about how linguistics is necessarily interdisciplinary because language is everywhere and so reading really widely is something that a lot of us are called to do just to understand the phenomenon we're we're observing to be able to describe the patterns that emerge in our data so I started doing work on um, athletes, on Black athletes and the way that they're described, they've been described over time in the media. And that over time part came in because I was looking just at Serena Williams at first. I was looking like just at the text that had been produced across her career. But I began to realize that I couldn't, I could observe patterns, but I couldn't really understand them. I didn't, many people, when I would present that work, were asking me things like, well, how do you know it's not about her gender? How do you know that what you're observing is about race, is racialization? How do you know it's not about her gender? How do you know it's not about her size? How do you know it's not about this conglomeration of things that makes an individual what she is? And I'm like, okay, how can I know? <laughs> you know, and part of that was go back in time, get as much time depth as I could. So instead of looking at one athlete, I looked at athletes over a hundred years. And when you start to realize that I'm looking at a hundred years and what I'm seeing is older than that because, because it's everywhere. So you go back as far as you have to go back to find where the pattern starts to be like, okay, so linguistic oppression starts <laughs> with the 1705 codification of slavery mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in this country, essentially, because when we're talking about racialized linguistic oppression, when we're talking about the things that started moving the words I was looking at in this athletics corpus, because I'm looking at words like unstoppable, insatiable, fierce, um, and guess who, in people who are being um, paid to fight in slave yards, forced to fight in slave yards, bet it, you know, a whole gambling ring and a whole economy uh, grew around their bodies smashing into each other um, without their consent, unstoppable, insatiable, fierce. So these same words are describing the, not describing the white men who are wrestling as professionals at this time, right? Um, so as old as that. Part of what I talk about with linguistic oppression in general, just that, um, you know, knowing, there's this fine line, um, linguistic discrimination is like both this operation that, that happens in our minds and also something that exists in the world. So discrimination, that's like telling the difference between two things of saying this voice is higher pitched than that voice. The speaker is closer to me or farther away. It's this, it's that. It's categorizing, putting things into groups, pattern matching, which is what our mind is doing at all times. There's nothing wrong in noticing that a voice comes from a woman or a black person or anything, somebody from the South, someone, right? There's no harm in noticing. It's just, what do you do? What do our minds do with that information once it's been noticed? You know, how are we binning it? Um, the answer to that, how are we binning it question is as old as text. Mm -hmm. We have had our ideas about women, about black people, about people with disabilities, about immigrants since before the printing press. So the minute we started printing the Gutenberg Bible, this like first mass produced text that um, again, a business, a business model. When, when language was written, people of color, women, the poor, already systematically kept out of material knowledge production. They were already not allowed to write. <laughs> it was not, it was already in motion when we started printing text. So black people, when we get, when we fast forward, you know, 300 and some odd years to enslaved people in, you know, what is too soon to become America, this, codification of slavery, this document is important because it tells us, it actually shows 
the dehumanization of this population. It shows us that they were able to use language again to like reclassify the humanity of an entire group of people. And it's something that we've seen happen over and over again, but in our immediate context, we have an actual document, you know, signed by actual humans in, you know, full light of day uh, that shows us where they said, we don't want these people to have access to the written word. We don't want them to be able to read. We don't want them to be able to communicate with each other. We, we believe that, you know, um, keeping them under domination is important because they, you know, they, they can't actually become literate anyway. So, you know, what's the point of you know, teasing them with it essentially is sort of how the document reads. Yeah. It's like, don't make them want something they can never have. Um, which like, aren't we so paternalistic? Like, it's, huh. It really comes from a place of care. That's like, <laughs> and so, and I think, yeah, showing these people, these showing everybody these documents is important to me because I didn't know they existed until I was like 33. <laughs> um, and I also, the, the gymnastics, the verbal gymnastics, um, it is, it is everything about language all tied together. The, the history, what it does for our present, the way the words are being used, what the words do in the world. It's all present in this, like, two sheets of paper. Yeah, it's horrifying, <laughs> isn't it? Um, A little. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think it just comes down to the fact that language is power, and we cannot underestimate that, and we cannot diminish that at all. It, it, this is this is power, and this is it. And it's education, and it's literacy, um, and it's, yeah. So that's just important, I think. Uh, yeah, and this is is like literacy is threatening, right? Yeah. It's it remains oh, yeah. threatening. Um, as we see something, I think, um, in a talk I gave, uh, in mid October last year, at that point, something like thirty one hundred books had been banned in the U.S. <laughs> just yeah. in twenty twenty three. Um, there are laws that restrict things that you can say in public, more censorship laws than we've had since the era of sedition in this country. So it's something to think about, you know, um, our rights, our rights to read and write <laughs> um, and speak aloud remain um, things that have to be reinforced. They're certainly not inalienable. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I see you. Okay. Um, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess like this is where I'm running in a little bit. Um, well, I don't know. I guess we can go anywhere from here, but this is yeah, just next to my list, but it yeah, is this. Yeah idea that there is linguistic oppression and then there is the linguistic ideology that oppresses right I don't know if this is at all a helpful distinction but that was just something that I was thinking about when I was reading yeah. your stuff I was like okay so there's linguistic but that feels different from like I feel oppressed by by this ideology or the stereotype this is great I love this question okay. it's because the nuance I think really matters and also in some ways I think helps people people who maybe feel called out by this kind of thing mm -hmm. to enter the conversation because yeah, yeah. okay standard language ideology or racial linguistic ideologies um yeah folk idea there's there's a number of them right standard language ideology lippy green comes in and tells us in 97 that there is a bias towards a language that's pulled from the middle class the spoken language of the middle class and that we just gener that it's like a general preference for that language across domains and people part of what we were just talking about like this idea of our language ideologies are older than print that's where it comes from like the standard language ideology this bias towards like this preferred way of speaking that's aligned with <laughs> this middle class is as old as the middle class right it is like as old as older than American English, older than every living language user. So the standard language ideology is something that is part of the linguistic system we're transferring in our genome. So whatever whatever form and function that's taking, we don't we don't every every new baby doesn't have to learn how to be like an upright forward facing whatever, right? So we're transferring that information, this these baseline categories about proper speech and improper speech or a prefer an ideal speaker like there's maybe a category for ideal speaker in everybody like an an idea of disordered speech in everybody um that's where the standard language ideology comes in 
when we're thinking about a bias, a lot of people maybe think about that as something that's much more active, but it really is this very fine line, implicit thing that is again, like about discrimination. It's about telling us like, this is an older voice and this is a younger voice. This is a fast talker. This is a slow talker, right? This is a proper talker. This is an improper talker. <laughs> um, linguistic oppression then, standard language ideology is maybe just something that just is, right? Yeah. Um, linguistic oppression then is this act. It's like the difference between racism and racists. It's like racists are people who act on those beliefs, those like passive beliefs that all are just maybe part of our zeitgeist that say like, there is a, there is a right way to speak, or some people don't have accents. Like this idea of people <laughs> taking that information yeah. and being like, my unaccented language is like this proper way. And I'm going to actively gatekeep, you know, <laughs> actively keep people out, not give them jobs. When I, when someone, I work at the front desk of a doctor's office and I know that we can't take everyone who calls. So I just do my own personal like <laughs> screening and be like, oh, this person has a Southern accent. They don't sound that smart. I don't want to have to deal with them when they come in here. So I'm just going to tell them we aren't taking patients yeah. like that kind of thing or that we don't have an apartment available. Um, this is a woman sitting here talking to me about her pain. So I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to assume that she's blowing things out of proportion and isn't actually experiencing things that I don't know, could be gallstones or uh, cysts or fibroids or this, or that, or I'm just going to, you know, not learn that endometriosis is a thing until my forties, even though I'm an OBGYN, like this kind of stuff yeah. wow. is like, <laughs> yeah. Like how do you get through medical school without it? Um, these kinds of things are linguistic oppression. Not every example means that those people in those places are like being actively racist or yeah. <laughs> right. But it's this thing of, I operate inside a system. I, I support the status quo. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't push. I'm not critical. I'm not critical of the institutions I find myself in and those institutions being the nuclear family, <laughs> you know, American politics, um, any chosen religion, right? Like not just you work for Amazon or, um, you know, your local school district, um, all, all of these things are tie into standard language ideologies because there are, you know, understood ways that are correct or incorrect to talk to your wife or your boss or your children or your postman, um, or doctor or this and that. And a lot of, a lot of those understood defaults really leave a lot of people out of moving through social life, um, yeah. you know, without conflict. Yeah. And just to pick up on a couple of those things. So, so number one, the housing discrimination thing, this is something we've seen for a long time, right? Starting with John Baugh back in the day, back in the nineties. Um, and then more recently, you actually did a study where you were looking at three different dialects and uh, calling up to ask for an apartment. And this is something, this is a study that we've seen before, but basically the apartment is available for some people and not available for others, depending on, on the voice that you call in. And I think with your study, it was, uh, there was, you were using African-American English, uh, Southern American English, and sort of this mainstream American English. And looking at like a, per and a perception study and things like that of looking at uh, what voice is considered polite, what voice is considered smart, what voice is considered educate, like all these different levels of things. And 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 uh, people really, really, there's a heavy stigmatization of non-standard dialects in this in in this country. Um, and then so there's so there's that there's like who gets the apartment, what who what's the apartment? I mean, Trump has gotten in trouble for this of the people coming to his apartment and like there's it's a black family and the, suddenly the apartment's not available and there's a white person and it is. Um, but then mm -hmm. also you have talked a lot about this. That I found this fascinating by the way. You were talking about how because I always I'd always known about this right like that black women's pain in hospitals is just it's it is not taken seriously right and people die they get seriously injured all these things there's so many stories especially in childbirth of women just not being believed that they're in severe pain but then you start talking about how this actually might have to do with like differing levels of semantic intensity whoa that's crazy because that means that it's not only just someone going oh you're a woman and you're black i don't believe you but it's also that there's a difference in the mechanisms we're using to communicate pain that differs between mainstream American English and African American English. So it's all these things coming together to create a very bad situation that continues to happen in the healthcare system. So yeah. Yeah. This is an important one. When a lot of times this is this is an important one because okay, semantic intensity 
but it's, it, it actually goes to exactly what we're talking about. This idea of like standard language ideology on one side and linguistic oppression on the other standard language ideology, our language ideologies in general inform our expectations. So most of the time, like you don't notice, you don't notice what your foot is doing unless you like step in water or something and you weren't expecting it. And you're like, Oh, like surprise, right? Like our, the N400 response of like, I've, I've registered change, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, like very exciting. Right. Um, th so we know, we know that this is what our brain is doing is just kind of just running, um, with our, uh, with its general expectations intact. Okay. So what do those expectations do? Like in the moment they work on both sides of this equation, right? So a black woman comes into a hospital and she's like, I have to, I have to make sure I speak as well as possible. I have to be as close to the standard as possible. Cause I want to be understood quickly and this and that, and get the answers, the exact answers that I need. Cause I'm in peril. <laughs> right. Whereas, and then this person who is seeing a black woman come in is expecting, like, if you are actually in pain, you're going to give me your most authentic language use. So you're going to come in here sounding like someone from the ghetto or someone who's an angry black woman, like enraged. Like I'm, I'm expecting you to be hulking out if you were actually experiencing pain because it insert like centuries of myth about the black body and, you know, et cetera, like what, and, and women, like women, we know they have a high, higher pain tolerance. So like even like a well-informed doctor you know, someone in the ER, right? Like even a well-informed doctor might have this expectation of, I have to see a bunch of people all the time. And this is what I think like a 10 on the pain scale looks like. This is what like how emergent cases present to me. So this black woman who's trying her very best to be understood <laughs> and is like holding down all of the feelings that she's feeling meets someone who is expecting someone in a serious condition to be not give a crap about the social contract and to just be like, I need help. I need help right now. The black women can't walk into any room and say, I need help. I need help right now. It's, it's just like not something that is possible. So many, and, and this is, this divide is pertinent for almost all medical encounters. So it's there, right. With what someone is feeling and trying to communicate and what the medical profession is anticipating as symptoms of an emergent condition. Right. But as with these, all of these other issues of oppression, this language barrier affects certain groups more than others. And so this rising maternal mortality rate for black women that has continued to go up and up and up since we started keeping records, that has, even though other interventions have been made in the medical space to make things more accessible and more inclusive, is because this language barrier persists and these language ideologies are as potent as they were the day we started keeping records. And so we don't, we don't see any motion on that score because the, the interactional moment is so fraught. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. It's horrifying. There's, yeah. It's horrifying. And there's also <laughs> this, this idea, right? Like you're talking about how like the, there's this like, the expectation that the doctor has that someone's going to be completely enraged and like completely flip out and they have no control over their voice if they're really in this much pain. And I, I, it reminded me of um this idea that was put forth. So at the Linguistic Society of America, um, Dr. Sharice King gave a presentation of her research on, yeah, on uh, our perception of of black voices in courtroom settings. So if it's a witness, if it's a prosecutor, how do we feel they're credible? Do we feel they're intelligent, right? All these things. And then are they speaking African-American English or mainstream American English? And do, do does the does the person being um, tested in the experiment know that this is a black person or not? Uh, and Dan Viriel raises his hand and says, I'm wondering if this is less about the fact that we are upset that someone is using African-American English or that we are judging their use of African American English, but more that as like the white jury member that is conscious that code switching exists if we're actually punishing black people for not code switching. And I feel like that is the reverse in the yeah, hospital, right? Exactly. Of you're coming into this place and it's like, I like doing whatever you can to get the help that you need. And then whatever it is, you, it just isn't enough because either yeah. you're not emotional enough or you're too emotional or it's not believable enough, or it is, or, it's, or that's unrealistic. How could you be that much in pain? The forensic linguistics literature is really fascinating. There's this one study about 
a man, um, a Latino man in, in Southern California court who uses a translator and he says, it, which is uh, itself apparently very fraught. So he goes, he goes onto the stand and he says in English, my English is not that good. It's my second language. You know, I want yeah. to use a translator because I want to make sure that I understand everything that I'm being asked. And then I can give you all like correct and detailed information. He like says that in, in English, in learner English, and then proceeds to answer the prosecutor's questions in Spanish through the translator. But then when the prosecutor is like closing, like the closing argument or whatever, he's like, you can't even trust this guy because he told you that he couldn't understand me. But then he answered some of my questions before the translator was even done. So like, how could you know what he's saying to you is true? Because he couldn't even talk to you. He could talk to you in English, but he chose not to. He, he wanted you to have a harder time understanding him. And this person who is testifying, I mean, he's like a witness. Like this person in this case who's testifying for go, gets the death penalty, like goes to jail for the rest of his life. And gets, ex, and you know, if, if California was executing people, he'd be executed by now. Maybe he will be executed later. Do you know what I mean? Like this thing of, it's not just about, um, it's not just about these like most dire cases. Like I understand like those are the ones we talk about. This, this yeah. example that I'm giving where it's like this person went to prison. <laughs> um, these people, you know, they get acquitted or not acquitted. You, they can't get justice. A lot of, a lot of this, like this ear witness testimony is in like domestic abuse or you know sexual assault cases and so it's these things where it's like i know that it was this person even though i didn't see anything because i heard them next door and so it's like we want that testimony to work yeah. we want it to work we want the science to be maybe the best science we're doing yeah. in linguistic science is the ones that can you know <laughs> limit someone's freedom directly specifically as part of our law and so, yeah, these cases where uh, Sharice, um, as Dr. King was on my uh, committee, my defense uh, dissertation committee. Oh, really? That's and <laughs> and she she's actually her work with Dr. Rickford. Yeah. That is my why I do what I do. Yep. Moment. Yep. I saw them present that bef before the paper came out at the LSA. It was like my second LSA. And this is and here in Rachel Jean. Tell. The Jean Tell, yeah, the yes. paper, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I had just finished. I was currently in my first sociophonetic class. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and like I had, you know, I'd been to like class one time and then went to the LSA, like it was the first week of January, right? Yeah. Um, and came back like, okay, sociophonetics, yeah. like we can actually do something real in the world. Like I could do so like the Zimmerman trial. I was glued to it. I was furious. Yeah. You know, and it's like you get I get there and I have I have all this energy for it. And then all of a sudden it's like, OK, we can actually use our science to show like exactly why this happened and why this is a problem and how language is playing a role in all these outcomes like right now. Like it's not even old. <laughs> um, yeah. And so that's that's what points me in this direction of saying, OK, yes, I haven't done a study on the healthcare industry. I haven't done a study on um you know, hiring practices for non-English speakers. But I know that those studies exist and that those issues are pertinent and that people are people are dying. They've been dying every day since I learned about it. <laughs> um, so to me, it's like, yes, where we should be, we should be answering these questions. I don't need every linguist to be working on healthcare, <laughs> the legal, you know, but I, I would like the questions that we're asking as a field to help us get closer to that definitive answer of being able to say how did I know that this listener was black or a woman or 20 feet away from me yeah. um you know yeah. th this kind of thing of let's we know that it works we know that that language is transferred we're getting it from other people and we're yeah. getting it incredibly reliably so the mechanism is discoverable I think is what's like the most exciting about it for me as a scientist yeah and I, I also um with the whole yeah hearing Rachel Jane tell I mean like that's 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 a, so that's a linguistics paper that like w makes you cry i mean like i hope it's okay that i'm saying this but like we yeah. so i had to read it for a class for nicole holiday's class and like coming to class and people were crying like it is 
the most interesting paper, I think, to read just because you are so angry and so frustrated that a young 19-year-old girl's language can be picked apart and degraded to this extent, right? When we're talking about a murder trial. Um, and and yet, like, also the frustration that, you know, why why do we have to, as linguists, make a case that someone's language is legitimate or valid or systematic, right? Like, it has to be. It's language. And, like, and we know that, but, like, the rest of the world doesn't know that. But then also, at the other hand, so... um. So Don Rickford is a professor emeritus, I think at Stanford now, and his wife, Angela Rickford, is also a professor emeritus at San Jose State. And I was talking to her and she said, yeah, we went down to see Rachel in and um, like sort of like in when the paper was published and everything. And I started teaching her how to read. And I said, what? She was 19 when the trial. No, 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 no. She went to like a really bad public school yeah. in a very low income area with t teachers that did not care and classmates that that's not what's happening and there's probably high rates of truancy and she has dyslexia but that's not a problem like that should not preclude anyone and yet and so that's that's the project was like was teaching her how to read and kind of that, that whole thing and um yeah so it just like there's so many consequences here i feel like when you get down to it of like the of consequences of people not knowing about language but also just consequences of linguistic oppression and the consequences of these yeah. ideal yeah yeah. People ask me a lot, like, there's a few interesting points of what you said. Um, it, people ask me a lot about, you know, well, how can it even work? You know, like the censorship that people are trying with, like, getting books out of libraries and getting yeah. people's words out of people's mouths. Like, can it even work? Um, of course it can. <laughs> because <laughs> when, mm. when what, what we're, what we're seeing, Rachel Santel is a perfect example of, like, a woman in this country with, you know, access to all pub all public opportunities um, available to her and still didn't have access, full access to the written word, um, that the literacy, the illiteracy rates are, you know, Black people are like 13% of our population, but 25, 27% of the nation's illiterate. Like there's yeah. this, the the ripples are still rippling. They haven't made it all the way to the shore yet from the the these anti-literacy laws. They're they're still affecting the ways in which black people and black language has developed. Um Dr. Rickford's work, um, I, I was I was fortunate to be able to like, share a meal with Rachel Zontel with at the Black Linguists have a gathering at conferences. She came to a conference in New York a few years ago when oh, they presented did. this oh, wow. work. Yeah, she was on stage with Dr. Rickford um, and and got to do like a fireside chat type thing and take questions from folks, Yeah, which to me was a little, I mean, like she was yeah. wonderful, but so many people were like, how did you experience this like really nuanced linguistic concept? And she was like up there like, you know, it was like one of the most traumatic days of my life. Like, I don't, you know, yeah. <laughs> like it's, such yeah. a, you know, like it's such a question, but I do, but she was really lovely just had it was so it was so nice to meet her and see her just being like this full and wonderful person um yeah. because I'd had such an experience with the paper myself of reading it and just being just irate and feeling like how do you even go on from this like this woman was destroyed she was not destroyed <laughs> you know, yeah. she lost, she lost a friend and she was like pilloried on national television, but here she is like stronger than ever, more joyful than I ever would have expected, you know? And so that was really informative to me and also put me on this path of trying to understand what it's like to go through these sorts of things for your entire life, because that was certainly not Rachel Jantel's first experience with linguistic discrimination. Um, certainly not, not even in the public. Um, and so it's this thing of when that is part of what it takes for you to walk out the door every day, you know, what does that do? What does that do to the psyche? And then more importantly, like, what does it do to the language? So part of where my work is headed now is maybe asking questions of, okay, we have like black language variation and change over time. We also know that Black language is this like engine of lexical innovation in yeah, our country. Yeah. It's like where we pull um, generationally, cyclically, all of these words and ways to describe things. How do we see that like engine of change where 
black language is maybe not used in the public, but still somehow gets filtered up and, and still informs and is still in contact with our standard varieties. Um, yeah. I'm really trying to understand like what is in the middle turning this cycle that's keeping some keeping something that our ideologies are trying to actively keep out of public space um, that somehow turns it right back into public space anyway. And what that means for, for black language users in the moment when they have, are called to choose between how they want to represent themselves. It's very rare that we have that like agentive moment of choice where it's like, I can go on the stand and sound like myself or I can try and sound as clear as possible. And I don't know what the right answer is. Um, it's part of the reason why I'm so interested in metalinguistics is like mm -hmm, yeah. these moments where it does rise to the surface, where we hear someone being so hyper aware of how their language shapes the way they're perceived that they tell people, I'm going to do something that you're maybe not expecting. And I'm doing it for this reason, because I want you to see me this way. Like we very rarely get that description of like, here are my three selves. <laughs> like, here's how I feel. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I would like you to see, <laughs> you know? And so it's, 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 um, I've taken a lot of lessons from that, from that kind of metalinguistic commentary where it's like, there's some people that just like have that awareness because it's part of every day. Yeah. I mean, well, I think like your study on the housing discrimination, I didn't know this so recently, but it was your voice. You were doing your three native dialects to like show the difference between mainstream American English, Southern American English, and then African American English. And that's a choice that, that's, I mean, it's kind of a privilege to be able to make that choice every day to like have that to be, and, and I mean, it Again, is. there's this tension, right, between like the 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 idea of a standard variety of a standard anything. It just it doesn't. It's 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 problematic, right? Like that is a problematic notion that it needs to be the standard variety in order for someone to be understood. But also, this tension between like to be able to be understood is a privilege, and it yeah translates to like tangible benefits in in the world. So, and this is the question because it's not yeah. accessible to everyone. It's not yeah. accessible and it has, this is why like embodiment is so yeah. such a part of what I am interested in now because the same, you can't, we could read off a paper, we could read the same sonnet, you know, to each yeah. other and it would not be this exactly the same, you know, we are two different people. Um, we, you can't say the same utterance the same way twice. That's like why we talk about this like infinite generation of language, right? Uh, it's, 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 it's interesting, right? It's, but when, yeah, my own voice encountering this as like a theoretical concept and being like differently embodied people can't make language in the same way, <laughs> you know, and yeah. then being like, okay, but that's not, that is like considering, that's like making this assumption, departing from a place of being like one person, one body, one variety. You know, mm -hmm. like my one person, one body, one variety can't make language the same as your one person, one body, one variety. Okay. But that's not real because we all have this like constellation of features at our disposal. Yeah. So part of asking the question, being inspired by Bob's work, he used his own voice. I went into that work, like not knowing, being like, oh, this is how like you do a match guy's study. You just like yeah, make your own yeah, stimuli yeah. and you go in and do it. Spending a number of years. <laughs> digging through data of people analyzing me very differently um, with incredibly minimal movement in my repertoire. Like we're talking about pitch changes and, you know, some, <laughs> you know, creative rearranging of vowel space, right? It's not um, all the phrasing is the same. It's not, it's yeah. not significantly different speech um, in my opinion, to my trained ear. Right? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the clip of um, the study of your, your voice in African-American English, it's African-American. It's, it's what we, it's what some a linguist might call standard African-American English. It right? is that. Because the, there's an absence of these morphosyntactic syntactic variables or features of African-American English, which we know are more heavily stigmatized than the phonological variation. So exactly. even then, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And there was, and both of us, so there's like a big, really meaty footnote in, yeah. Yeah. in, in yeah. there um, right. about how at one, I did earlier work. I did like some prior work where we had very, um, almost like mock dialect versions of all three. Cause the standard one sounded like an NPR host, you know, it was like <laughs> all the way up there. Right. And then <laughs> the other, 
Um, and yeah, and the other two, and then the Southern one was much more Southern. Like to me, <laughs> to me, part of the reason why I redid the stimulate all is because I'm from the South. I'm from the American South. And I was like, this sounds like a cartoon. <laughs> like I understand that it came out of my own mouth, but nobody in Knoxville sounds this way. And we're going to be running this study in Knoxville. So like, it needs to sound more local. It needs to sound more natural. Um, and that's when we decided to just like go with my own voice. <laughs> um, it was like, just do this, how you do it. And it was like, okay. Um, that the thing that gets me the most that maybe ties into this larger conversation we're having in the assessments of my voice in the housing study, which they're kind of two studies. There's like, I audited people, <laughs> um, to say like, if I call the same, you know, the same landlord, like, do we see whatever? And we do see whatever, um, <laughs> the, right. yeah, yeah. So whatever is seen. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the other study then is like taking recordings from those calls and being like, what do people do with this in the lab? Like, what are yeah. they hearing? How do they pull it apart? Yeah. What's really interesting and in how they pull it apart is, and part of what maybe puts some of this into like a more detail is none of these people are being like, that's a black voice and I don't like it because blah, you know, yeah. I'm just asking, I'm asking like, give me, rate this voice on 10 character traits. Yeah. And one of those traits is feminine and masculine, two separate traits. They're not on like binary ends of a spectrum. It's like zero to a hundred. Like this is the most feminine voice I've ever heard. <laughs> or yeah. this is the most masculine voice I've ever heard, right? Yeah. The black voice, the black dialect is rated as the more masculine sounding voice, but they're all clearly on the feminine end of the spectrum, right? Like it's not masculine at all. Like it's, they're the highest, the rating for the masculine voice, the highest number is 15. So it's 15% male sounding mm -hmm, mm -hmm. versus like 13 versus like 11. So it's like not even that much of a range, right? Which is, but okay, I don't have the most feminine voice ever, right? Okay, okay, okay. So that spread of points, when you get through all the math, that spread of points, this idea of femininity, masculinity, not femininity, because there's a rating for that, right? Like <laughs> masculinity leads to massive decreases in trustworthiness and intelligence, which are the two things that are apparently most important for the landlord who's listening. So the landlord wants to know if he can trust you and if you're smart enough for not to waste his, their time, like as a tenant, right? Of like, are you gonna be breaking stuff all the time? <laughs> like, <laughs> or having friends over or doing whatever, you know, like this kind of thing. They wanna know that you're trustworthy. We're talking about four points. We're talking yeah. about four percentage points. We're talking about something that is barely, like we would think would be barely perceptible, but it's incredibly perceptible. And it's so much so that it really influences people. So a black woman, black female speech is, is masculine, is rated highly masculine. We also know that like black speech, like black vernacular speech has these like masculinization tendencies. Um, Norma, Norma Mendoza Denton has done some really good work on that. Um, mm -hmm. Especially looking at like the creations um, and R.S. Clemens on the creations of like a Dominican identity, which sits like in between like Latinidad and, and the black community and um, immigrant communities. Really, really interesting about how like machismo plays out in mm -hmm. African-American language and stuff like that. So it's, that's, it's something to do with, like, again, like, I know that angry black woman is a thing. I know that people maybe hear my voice is more masculine and therefore more aggressive. And so when I go into the doctor's office or when I'm calling the landlord, I'm trying so hard to be like, hi, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking my call. You know, like that kind of thing of like, hi, I'm just yeah. I'm calling. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like. I, this is when it's your own voice, yeah. it's so hard to then go back out into the world and be like, okay, okay. So I, yeah, struggle with producing language in an authentic way in a lot of spaces because I'm a hyper aware of how I sound and what the, what I'm doing. And also I am actively trying to reincorporate aspects of my black variety into my daily life. Because I feel like of these three varieties that are very much a part of me and I spent all these years studying and trying to understand in my own self, 
it is this black voice that I have, I feel like is the most censored in my own experience. And in having conversations with black professionals over the last few years, it doesn't seem like there's much time in the day where many of these people are just using language in this like at rest in this less laborful state where they don't feel like they're filtering something or watering something down or being careful. And so I, I try really hard to keep a baseline, Yeah, you know, just to be like, this is how I use language. And then some cases, maybe I'm called to move that up or down on a style spectrum, but yeah. It's it's interesting to me. I kind of have a question about that whole thing of like the masculinity because it's interesting that mm-hmm. black women are seen as less trustworthy in all these things for sounding more masculine. But what about the men <laughs> that sound incredibly <laughs> masculine? What? It's almost as if masculinity isn't constant. What? Um. Yeah. It's almost like yeah. yeah. And and the men and men who sound more feminine are less trustworthy as well. So it's not like a one to one. It's Ooh, not like yeah yeah yeah. I guess your most masculine sounding male is your, yeah, very trustworthy, but your most masculine sounding female, not. Is it, is it your most trust? Is it, is it your most masculine sounding white male? How does it? That's Yes, yeah, probably. Okay. That's a yeah, good yeah. question. That's a good yeah. question because I think certainly, yeah, because American l- listeners will trust anything a British accented person says. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, colonization. So they don't, you know, <laughs> but so I mean, you don't that, find whiteness like, and intelligence. Like, what? Kelly. Yeah. It's interesting, but it's like that of like, who is your best yeah, trust? Yeah, yeah. But then some people, you know, um, it might be some guy, you know, like the Allstate guy who just passed away. Rest in peace. I can't remember his name. Mm-hmm. <laughs> at the top yeah. Of I head. wonder how that. that factors in. Yeah. To like celebrities like Idris Elba or things like that. Or like Morgan Freeman. Like yeah. The narr- Morgan Freeman narrates my life. Like that yeah, kind of yeah. thing of like, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, you said something earlier about attractiveness. Attractiveness is interesting because we get that, we make a decision about that as fast as we do all these other things. Mm -hmm. So when we're listening, when we're listening, age, gender, class, right? Race, we've been sexuality, all of that comes really fast within 300 milliseconds. But we also make a decision about do we trust this person? Like, do we trust this person? How, how smart are they? How hot are they? <laughs> we decide all in this like band of milliseconds. And you know, there's debate on which happens first or if one informs the other or whatever. And that's probably different for everybody, a little different for everybody. But I think, yeah, it's so fascinating that we're like, do I trust you? Are you hot? Um, and, and if both of those things are no, like it's, and if both uh, of those things are no, like what happened, yeah. cause it's like, I may not trust you, but you are very hot. And so I will continue listening at least for another minute. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's that of like, it can change. And also there's a, an interesting study from, um, the New Zealand folks. Um, what's her name? What's her name? What's her name? There is a study. Um, from when someone was, I think it was Katie Drager. She was a graduate student um, yeah. when this study was being written. And it's like, mm, let me think. I don't want to, oh, I don't want to Oh, oh right. So she did an ethnography, a sociophonetic ethnography of Selwyn. So probably in New Zealand, that's Selwyn, girls high school. Selwyn, <laughs> yeah. Selwyn? Uh, girls yeah. high school. This, yes. Yes. So, one of the in a couple of okay. these perceptual studies that she's involved in is like they have this meaty footnote that's like she's super attractive it's like blonde hair blue eyes tall yeah, yeah, yeah. thin gorgeous woman right and it's like this and in these indigenous cultures like it means something to be like a tall you know like it always does yeah. like what we look like but it's something of like we're pretty sure that our results are influenced by who's in the room. And, and, and that study was, is interesting to me because that's always relevant, <laughs> you know, yeah. like this decision that we make about our interlocutors, they're always relevant, but we've got this one big footnote that is like, it was a hot blonde. So we don't know for sure if this is like actually a good science because like it was a hot blonde. So we should like make sure to like retest that. Yeah. But like, we don't see, we don't see that. Like it was a white dude. It was like a, it was like a balding middle-aged white dude who ran this study. So like, yeah. we may want to retest that 
actually, why don't you bring in a hot girl and see if you get the same answer? You know what I mean? Mm. Like for me, I'm like, why is this the only place I've ever seen this footnote? Yeah. Why is this the only place I've ever seen this footnote where they were like, actually, we think that researcher identity perhaps relevant in the ways in, like in the results that we received, but I've only seen it where it was like hot chick, you know, what are you going to do? How are you going to do science with like an attractive woman in the room? Like, be, and, and it's this thing of like, we it's actually if- moved that needle forward on understanding the, <laughs> the effects of attractiveness because of this, like this weird comment, you know, like now we've dug deep into that and know that it's as fast and know that all this other stuff, but like, it's almost Let as if the boys can't like. concentrate when there's a hot girl in the room or if her, if, if her tank top thing or whatever isn't, what is it? Three fingers or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's also like, yeah. there's like this window because if you're not hot, if you're under attractive, you yeah. know, or, or your, you know, your features are under desired or non-normative people are not listening to you then either. So there's yeah. like this somehow like Overton window, like just hot enough to talk in public. Right. But not, yeah. Yeah. It is interesting. I had a professor tell me once that being like successful in linguistics or like they said it sort of like offhandedly to the room. They were like, being hot, I recommend. Being a hot linguist, I really recommend because then maybe you'll like popularize the field or something. Um, and I just thought that that was like really interesting. Stephen Pinker, um, obviously hottest. Oh yes. I can think of. right, right, you know right, I mean? like, like right, come right, on. right, 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 like Steve, like no offense, area. sir, but you know what I'm saying? Like it's not. <laughs> no, but like I don't, like, I don't think anyone not. was like judging him. No one was like, oh, like yes. young, bright, very, very bright student from from you know McGill or whatever. Oh yeah, let's right. not accept him to the PhD program because like what? Like yeah, you know, like and and little and then again, I feel like also that with with like men for some reason it's this thing where it's like once there's status and once there's money and once there's intelligence like doesn't really matter what they look like 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 I can name a yes. lot of academics that have been married multi many times like we're just like rich men like have you seen like like okay Elon Musk like just I don't know yeah uh-huh yeah uh-huh yeah it's, yeah I mean yeah. I think about this a lot of this yeah I don't, I don't want to pull us in a new direction, but it's yeah. <laughs> women's language. It's such a thing I've done. Like recently we just did a, like a part two on the radio show about women's language. And it is very much this thing of like. It's the, it's, but, it's you're, you're appeasing, you're appeasing. And it's a constant strategy. I think that a lot of constant. female celebrities talk a, a lot about how it's like, you know, men or strategic women are calculated, but it's like, whether it's calculated or strategic, we are all doing it, but women do it a lot more because it is always this game of how much, what do I present? What do I show to what degree, right? To end, because oftentimes it's this, it's this thing, because I have been told my whole life, it's so annoying, Talia, you're so flirty. It's like, no, I'm energetic. I smile because I've been told to. And I'm just like largely like an engaged person, but that, yeah. that, that you just, you're like, please don't depending on the context. <laughs> what? Sorry. Please don't sexualize my energy. <laughs> right. 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 It's, right. It's the thing of like, whoa. Like I think that by existing, it's always like either, either you're flirting or you're not flirting enough or like celebrities talk about, like people said to them that they need to like start showing more skin on audition rooms or less skin in audition rooms. And I think with a linguistic equivalent, like no one's like actually going to walk up to you and be like, you know, you really should start raising your trap bowels, but like, <laughs> but that, but like they'll say something else that is equivalent to that. Right. Um, my current research on Hillary Clinton is about her change in monophthongization of the price bell over time. Like that probably wasn't phrased her that way. It was probably phrased her as Hillary, you might want to sound a little bit more Southern. Right. Because we're getting, right. So like, this is the thing. Of, and, that, and the question there with my research on her was really like, to what degree did she have to parallel Bill Clinton? Right. And that's a pretty sexist idea that one, that one's wife must sound like them. Um, it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's an important, that's an important and interesting question too, to think about like as her, maybe like autonomy um, shifted away from Bill Clinton that like she yeah. didn't actually have a space to be like linguistically creative or yeah, yeah. more representative of herself. It was like, I didn't gain linguistic autonomy. There's yeah. like yeah. some really interesting, um, there's, there is a lot of work um, or people out here who are asking a lot of these really nuanced questions about what it means to like do gender 
I think yeah. that's this, this growing area of the field um, where people are really starting to investigate that. And, and it matters because as you're saying, like women, this idea of like sociolinguistic labor, every time, every room that I'm in, when I present this concept, there is always a woman, at least one who comes up to me afterwards and is like, I do this all the time. I do it every day. I do it in these ways. I told you about the woman with the, with the bags, but it's, it's, I have so many examples and it's that of, I struggle to communicate this idea to men. Mm-hmm. That sociolinguistic labor is even a thing, that it's something that's done, that it's something that people are aware of. And then I have this whole other group of people who just comes up and is like, oh, I totally get this. Like this happens like example, example, example. And so for me, I have a question. It, it answers, it opens up questions about like knowledge building and what it means to, what meaning is, what it means to know stuff. Because like common knowledge, like the ways in which we build something that's generally understood that goes into building these language ideologies that goes into maintaining the standard language ideology of saying that there's one preferred way to do things um how do we begin to edit our ideologies we see that happen over time they certainly change um the ways that we think about women are not all the same Mm -hmm. um but there may be echoes of these like older women are weaker women are not as smart women are this women are that um that we see just like playing out and being maintained in these like um like more subtle ways for like the housing discrimination is the same in that segregation has not been legal for over 50 years Mm -hmm. um any of those integration i mean it was this idea of we just take down the walls right and then (laughs) you all can live in harmony that's what happens we just we just make it explicitly illegal to bar you but all of those neighborhoods have maintained their character over time the ones that haven't been gentrified because we we just police those boundaries ourselves we were we do all of that work um we move it all into the linguistic space where it can be done less overtly and so that's yeah this the populations that i am most interested in protecting are the women who are at most most at risk in all of these areas that we've been talking about because yeah they they seem to be the ones that need our collective help like as a field the most like these populations of women in who can't get housing who can't get health care who you know and men of color into the country yeah Yeah, i do think men of color but but also well but also men of color i think sometimes like we really i mean that is like a huge site of linguistic oppression as well especially absolutely yeah we talking. yeah yeah we really see this in high risk jobs so people of color people who don't have ac- men of color who in people who don't have access to english like immigrants mm. um or, or english language learners get offered a job that pays a lot of money you know and mm. they don't mm. exactly it's not they get paperwork you know that like a hold harmless clause for the company of saying like as you wade waist deep into toxic waste Mm -hmm. um you know you may experience like some any of these negative symptoms or whatever and they're like great I get paid eighty dollars an hour fantastic like I will go do that and so then there are these pop those are the populations that experience the most on-the-job deaths um so across industries in the United States English language learners and men of color are the people who experience the most on-the-job deaths because they don't understand the information that's given to them or they aren't given information that acknowledges them of their the risk. Yeah. Um, and so the only way is that certain things get done, like mixing up the materials that pave our streets, um, you know, cleaning our sewers, um, you know, ha- uh, getting high-speed internet to rural areas. Those, those kinds of things are are done by 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 a population of workers that is expected to die. That's really sad. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, and and that, that expectation is maintained through this link linguistic ignorance. Yeah. And um, whose so. whose life is is yeah, there's a profit wow. margin. There's a profit margin by keeping mm-hmm. keeping people out of equitable like communication. 
Yeah. Yay. I know. It's, it's so joyful. Every time I'm here talking about something, it's always. I know. It's always joyful. Well, well, genuinely, mm-hmm. I want to say it's been very joyful to have you here. Mm-hmm. And uh, I always give people, you know, the opportunity to kind of say anything they want to say, leave the world with inspiring, critical, beautiful things to say. Um, but also this question of why linguistics? And people take this in all kinds of different directions, but I just love hearing the answers. Um, but I think for you, it's like, I don't, you are working towards goals that are bigger than one field. You are working towards goals of racial and social justice, equality, equity, things like that, right? Decolonization, like anti-racism, anti-sexism, all these things come through your work. And it's so inspiring to watch. Um, um, You're looking at like, like just these words that you're using, justice, right? Oppression, like this is not just about language, but yet you're doing it through language. You're studying language. So why linguistics? Why language? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think for me, I am still continually fascinated by language when the capital L. I mean, from when I took my first class as an undergraduate um, until today, the, wo- the wonder only increased at all of these things that we can do, that we do, that we do <laughs> with it, that that we are even capable of communicating with all of these variables, that somehow all of the stuff that our field is desperately trying to figure out and describe, the human, the organ, uh, the system, we has it completely figured out. We are doing language as experts with individually contained systems all day, every day, <laughs> right? So mm-hmm. that to me is still part of the reason why I do the work that I do that's equity focused is because I want everyone to get at a place where they can share in this wonder that I have, where they can sit down and look at their own language use, look at language being used around them and being like, isn't that so cool? Look at how different it is. Look at how expansive it is. Like, you know, how everyone does everything differently. And isn't that so neat? Like, that's like the, isn't that so neat place that I just want everyone to arrive at with me, please. But, um, and so, and I really do feel that with just a little more general understanding of what we, every single one of us is doing every day with this system that like structures our thoughts and helps us share ideas and build society. Um, a lot of these issues, these, these most, you know, acute harms, maybe start to fade away on their own, right. Or just at the end of, at, at the end of the day, products of misunderstanding. So I hope that we can, you know, move towards the side of recognizing and celebrating instead of recognizing and vilifying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that got back. I mean, a lot of things in there, but like access to education and just, you know, being able to share, because I talk about it and people like, look at me, like, it's a little bit of a cliche and like, maybe it is, but it's, but it is true. I think learning is very joyful. And I think that I really do enjoy learning. And um, that's also like, in the human condition like we are kind of just yeah that's that's what we like to do um but i think that but people are not given the access the ability to do that and so i i feel very lucky every day to to be able to study study language and linguistics and talk to people like yourself i mean this is a real a privilege to be able to speak to professors and postdocs and grad students and undergrads and and all the, all these people and and find out what you are interested in um so yeah well, thank you for doing it. You know, I said that to you before, but I just, I want to reiterate it here that this thing that you're doing, sitting down and having really honest conversations with about language is, is really important. It's really helpful for your listening public. And so I'm really grateful to you for engaging with it in a bigger way. Of course. And thank yeah. you. I mean, I just. the My perfect job would be one that would allow me to very easily work within communities so doing policy driven work um means that i move from topic to topic you know this idea of like we're housing over here and now we're talking about language and law and now we're talking about this is that the communities i'm embedded in i am really interested in finding out you know what linguistic justice issues are important to them and being like okay i'm a scientist i'm an expert like how can i you know help help you with this so there are areas of the country that I feel like, you know, linguistic justice, these, these harms are, these more specific harms are maybe easily, more easily addressed. 
I don't, we're, we're at the end. I don't want to like take you down a different road, but thinking about, um, I know this does not have to be in the episode. This is not like, okay. I'm just like, yeah, language wondering. and education, this thing of like, one of the reasons why black people still don't have representation in schools yeah, is because the two, mo- the legal arguments the legal arguments available to us have already been tried. The most like the the ones that make the most sense have essentially already been tried, which was one trying to make the case that dialects are equal to languages and that didn't work. And then the other one is trying to make the case that um, black African-American English is a language in its own right. And so therefore is already is entitled to rights that already exist in the constitution yeah for right i would really like to be involved in whatever whatever and wherever stage three of that fight takes place but the question really has to do with what's your legal argument like what's the case you need like the right case (laughs) to be able to make the new legal argument and it doesn't feel exhaustive, but it is in some ways rather exhaustive of saying here we're saying they're equal and here we're saying it is language and both of those failed. So there's like, there's some, there's gotta be something that reinvigorates that precedent. What I'm most interested in is talking about why the entire woman's body is profane. Yes. <laughs> why the entire female body yes. is profane. Yes. <laughs> so. But is that part of it actually? Like, I mean, because like, it's there is some type of think fuck and like vagina, but like not really. I mean, like kind of, but also like don't say that, you know. There's this, there's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> um, I mean, essentially, any process, any female bodily process is something that's somehow profane. Like you yeah. at, at, at different times, like even just like the breast, chest, milk, breastfeeding like all of those things, like lots of things, like exposing a wrist or a neck or an ankle at certain points of time, you know, you're like, they're all out. (laughs) Ha ha. Yeah, no, it's that it's yeah. So there's a lot, there's a lot. Um, I also, yeah, I taught, I teach a class on profanity and the final on the final, they, I give them a hundred euphemisms for vagina. And then I'm like, okay, describe like, comment on these using our course concepts really like for, that's yeah that's 100. like hundred there like, are over a hundred I mean I'm thinking oh there like, are so many wow we, you, things like you know like all the muff ones and all the clam ones and then there's like caves and sausage holster and it's all that they're all bad they're some yeah. of them are funny they're yeah. <laughs> Do you ever like watch like Ellen on the Ellen show? She would do that thing where it was like name five words for your private part. And then like the celebrities would be like a pizza, like Adele's like mini moo, a pizza. Like, and you're like, what? Like what? I would never like my box. Like what? <laughs> you're like, okay. Like, yeah. A lot like, of them are food related. Um, yeah. But also just like since when, like I, I just, I like pretty much exclusively say vagina. Like, but that's yep. not even the anatomically correct term. It's vulva. Right. It's such a thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a thing. Like, ah! I mean, I remember, you know, when I was in high school, the vagina monologues came out. Yes. And it was such yes. a thing of like being like, oh, wait, like we literally don't look at or talk about our bodies. Like, how do we even know stuff? And then it was like, actually, I don't know anything <laughs> is what I've learned. I did a performance like, of the vagina monologues in a high school. Really? Yes. <laughs> That's so cool. The one where she has an orgasm for the first time, the one where she goes awesome. to the class or something like that. But there was like, like a bunch of other of us did monologues and you know, there's the one about like the hair and there's the one about the hand like, mirror. Child abuse. Yeah, with the what? The hand mirror. The hand mirror. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but even that it's like, she says at the beginning of the monologue, like my vagina is a shell or something like that. And you're like, okay um like in yeah what way? in what way my baby but yeah the hair one is the one that I think about to this day because it's the thing that I still think persists in like a really weird way um that I do judge and I am conscious of the fact that maybe I shouldn't judge it but I do think like wow the world that we would live in if women didn't have the economic um like trap of having to buy razors and and like and just like the pain and the like it's yeah. not actually great for you and 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 things like like that yeah there's a lot yep 
Yep. Yeah. Um, I know there's like a hundred industries we could talk about, but it's all, there's so, there's so much linguistically going on. I think one of the one, um, gosh, what's her name? What's her name? Um, Carmen Fout. Carmen Fout? Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's done like all this wonderful work on like how corporations use feminizing language. Yeah. Disney. Like, Disney. The, the Disney yeah. work, yeah. but she's, she's recently moved to looking at like pink washing mm-hmm. in like advertising or whatever. Yeah. And I just like, yeah, I'm like, why it yeah it's such a thing it's such a thing of like not only are you making me shave but I have to shave with a shittier razor that has That's glitter pink, right? in the we plastic. went from semiotics like, to linguistics to semiotics back again like all the, yeah it's so like and I talk a lot about yeah like in this conversation of the limits of awareness of like this freedom of choice thing yeah oh, especially with like the the racialization like because journalists they always want me to give them like a list like okay well just give me a list of words that I can't say yeah. just give me the list. And I'm like, okay, I can't <laughs> like you are fun- fundamentally misunderstanding the conversation. If you're asking for a list, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also like, it's such a thing of like, I can't, I can't do that because the language is in motion, but also there's so much, if I actually wanted to sit down, I could just be like, well, don't compare everything to a white male norm. <laughs> or don't you know right. literally um, the acronym norm non-mobile older rural males, males. Rural like, males yeah or like and don't yeah or don't like why don't you respect the largest consumer base and stop infantilizing us because here we're going to be out here spending money anyway like yeah. this whole like the pockets conversation mm. like I, I can't I have I have two incredibly long-winded rants one is about pockets the other one is about lawns the pockets, someone was talking, my aunt was talking about this yesterday. She's like, I buy a lot of men's jackets. They have pockets. Pockets? Where are the pockets? Pockets, pockets, bicycles, and pants all kind of came along at the same time. And each one of them created in like an absolute frenzy yeah. in the street. Like a woman on a bicycle with pleated pants with her hand, like hands in pockets. Yeah. He were the de- decline of society. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. this woman is can go anywhere without you. She don't That's need shit from you, and that is terrifying. It's terrifying, and yeah. we're still She's got out transportation. Here. Yeah, yeah, we're still out here untold goods in our, you know, <laughs> carrying yeah. untold goods, going wherever we want, and it's it's no one is okay with it. I mean, it's Hillary was okay. in an interview. Someone asked her, Hillary, why do you wear pantsuits? And she was like, for fuck's sake, do you really want to know why? It's because I used to wear skirts because I was first lady and everyone wanted me to wear a goddamn skirt. And then I was in a certain place and I was walking up a flight of stairs and the paparazzi wait at the bottom of the stairs and use a long lens camera to get pictures of my skirt. That so I stopped wearing out. skirts and I started wearing pantsuits. And now Next you won't question. vote for me because you think I'm too masculine. Yeah. Next question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like I, I found like the, that was like the, that was like the most insane thing ever. I was like, what? Like, she was like, do you it, want the real answer? Because I'll give it to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then I remember telling someone that, and it's like really interesting. And someone was like, yeah, it's really interesting how like we've moved on from that as a society. Like, I don't think paparazzi would do that today. And I like, I agree, sure. But also like, it wasn't that long ago. And like, you'll do other things. Sure they are just as bad. You might not wait, wait on the bottom of the flood of stairs with a long lens camera because like you are afraid of like getting sued. But like still, come on. Or like more, more women are like not wearing skirts because like frankly, they suck. I'm sorry. But like, you know, <laughs> there's also that. Um, they limit Yeah, no, ability. like I'll do a lot of things to avoid a waistband. Yeah. yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I do. It's a thing. It's a thing. And also like, I have this folder of stuff that's like things people feel like they can say to you because of your body. That's okay to say to you because of your body. And it's like, sometimes, you know, you'll be like, I actually don't think I'm going to wear this today. (laughs) Like, I think I'm going to change. I I actually want to wear this cute dress today. It's, it's nice. It's a spring morning, whatever. Like, (laughs) but I'm not, I don't want to invite whatever lewd comments or this that and the other thing or just how I just would rather avoid it so I'm just gonna like put on jeans and sweatshirt it's like that of like don't perceive me it's like this way of like this like don't perceive me place is like let me just like 
make myself look like as bulky and unattractive and like yeah. pseudo masculine as I can. So I'm just like, oh, I'm not out here for conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to like buy eggs. Like it's like, that. <laughs> yeah. Don't so mm-hmm. don't perceive me. Um, versus like, oh, I felt great today. I wanted to wear yellow. Everyone should see me. <laughs> it's like not what I'm trying. I'm not trying to say everyone look at me. I'm just trying to be like, it was nice out. <laughs> This is what I felt like wearing today. I, I love that um like little clip online of like I don't dr- I dress for young girls who just get told get told all the time that they can't express themselves. Like I do not dress for men. I do not dress for other women. I dress for young girls who get t- told all the time what they can and can't do. And it's like oh my god, which I love. So That's every once in a while, like yeah, this like past Halloween, I bought like some like um wings, like butterfly wings and. Like this kind of stuff I've been like trying to like, lean into the fanciful um for that That's reason because it's crazy. so hard it's That's so hard so, to do stuff yeah like I just <laughs> wow imagine oh my god I, I dress for the young girls that were told yeah I dress for all the women that are told to cover up their cleavage because yes. it's really out every day for me yeah yeah yes yeah. I know and I still that is still a thing oh yeah that is still such it's a in thing. the it's in the okay I have attended two colleges now because I'm a transfer student and in both um well at least one in the like career guide handbook online it was like what to wear to the interview and there was a little note about avoiding cleavage and it and and maybe it's true I don't know um yeah. but but that was definitely a thing and I was like wow you're really printing that you're really putting that in print aren't you really putting that in print right and there uh. is like it's like me I love to be covered to the neck it's just like, but it is like, my mom was like, you look so severe. Yeah. Right. So right. Severe. Cause then you're severe otherwise. Yeah. So there's this, crude? like this, yeah. this like handful of inches, like in between <laughs> where it's like, not all the way up, not all the way down, you know, somewhere in this mid range is safe. Yeah. So someone, like, I, someone like once made a LinkedIn post about um my podcast, in fact, and mm-hmm. then someone uh, said to me, you know, your LinkedIn photo makes you look like a bimbo. You should edit out your cleavage. Nice. And I thought that's so funny. And they said, if you want people to, if you, they said, if you want people to take you seriously, you need to edit out your cleavage. And I was like, that's so interesting because someone just made a LinkedIn post about my 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 create my my podcast, the the academic, the the. I yeah. was I was I was really in a tumble. That one I'm like I'm like joking about it now, but it was like genuinely very upsetting at the time. I was yeah. like, what the? F-? I was like, really? God, I senior, like, what? <laughs> my first my first year on the job market, I had a senior linguist. Um, famous linguist that we all know, uh, come into my inbox on Twitter and say that if I was serious about getting hired, I needed to change my profile picture. Who was it? Um, John McWhorter. Can I put that in the, in the episode? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> no. no. Wait. Know. He yeah. he actually DM'd you. Did he know you? Yeah. He knew he you, and he DM'd. He you. knows me, and he DM'd me. I know I'm like maybe we should believe it not like he's gonna hear it um, he'll never he doesn't know this thing and is. said yeah that I that I needed to change my profile picture because it wasn't very professional looking which it's it's like a selfie it's like not you know it's like it's again like from the neck up it's like not even anything like I don't like, like what are you referring to like number one what are you referring to but and and also it like came from this like place of care like this place of like I know you're like really trying to get a job. So like, let me help you. (laughs) Um, But it sticks with me a lot. And I tweeted about it. I tweeted about it when it happened. I didn't say who it was, but it was like this. Everyone was like, that's, that's wild. Like my picture is like me holding a banana up to my face. It's like a fake phone, you know, like this kind of stuff of like plenty of like, we all have jobs and we have regular pictures. Like you don't need to worry about that. But the fact that I like really took it to heart, like at first, like didn't quite recognize it for what it was like even being so steeped in these things that I do like I was like oh like maybe I really like should think about that and you know now I don't know ever since then I've been sending people selfies I'm like I have headshots but when they ask for a picture I'm like here's the bathroom selfie (laughs) because I like this picture you know um yeah yeah so your profile that was the it was the selfie that he was upset about I guess I guess I don't know yeah he didn't give any context he just said it didn't look that professional and it's not like it wasn't that's what I mean it's not revealing it was just a picture of my face (laughs) like yeah I don't know like how like 
it could be unprofessional. It's just my face. But even if it was revealing, like, what are you <laughs> supposed to do? Like, I like this is the thing. It's like I think that a lot of women, um, like especially it's especially women that with curves and things like that, women that are not this like double zero model body. It's like you're tired of like apologizing. You're having to like do, do take extra steps to make yourself look professional or like hide your body. Like you know, a woman that was 100 pounds or 50 pounds lighter could wear that shirt, but it just like wouldn't be cleavage and it wouldn't be a problem. I exactly. Think that, like, what- I think about that all the time <laughs> because I've been fi- I got fired from like a couple jobs like one when I was when I was younger when I was a teenager and one of them specifically because I was a hostess they gave us they issued us uniforms yeah and I was told like you can't work here because your body is too distracting in this uniform which like that's wild like (laughs) do you know what I mean like you made this like it's not my you and also you knew what I looked like when I came in here like you didn't have an idea of what I was going to look like in your like company issue clothing. And I think about that a lot. Like I, it, it, it sticks in my mind. Like I'll see women like presenting or something and be like, I could never wear that. Like what she has is cute, but I couldn't wear it. Cause it would be like, look so different on me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have another friend who I was talking to this about, she's a stand up comedian. And oh, nice. she says like, she always has to be like, so put together. Like it's this thing of like, I feel like when I'm on stage and everyone's looking at me and I want them to hear me and I want them to laugh with me that I can't be like, because it doesn't fit the personality that I use on stage. Like everything has to match. Like if she gets heckled, she has to like stay in character and deal with a heckler. Like, she's like, I can't just, you know, even though I'm traveling or something, I can't like go up in sweatpants or like do this or do that. I have to be like very put together. So, because this is like what people are expecting me to look like. Um, that if that then giving them incongruent information, they spend more time thinking about like, damn, that shirt's tight, <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, and then versus like, what, what were we talking about? So it's this thing of, it's a, it's a hard, um, yeah, this doing self thing, it's very complicated. And there's a lot, there's a lot at stake. It's not just this like successful transmission, this successful understanding of self of like, I'm trying to be an adult woman and you're seeing an adult woman and we're both doing that together. Like it's more than just that. Cause I think that's where I start to get angry at the foundations of the field. Yeah. These like handful of white men for the most part, not all um, who sat down and started being like, maybe social information is in- important to linguistics and like, let's carve out some space for theorizing that. Hmm we're asking all these questions where it was like, okay, so now you're being, so now you're being black. (laughs) Tell me what that's like, or, you know, now you're doing this or now you're doing that. They, they maybe like weren't even in a position to complicate it enough because their own language use had never been troubled or their own language use had never felt like labor Mm -hmm. to them. So it's this thing of like, you can't even, you don't even have access to like the question. (laughs) like the relevant question of like, okay, we know things about each other, but what does that mean? What does it mean when someone's identities are just not receivable by the public? Why well, yeah. can't, I can't be a young, competent, in, <laughs> intelligent woman who's also trustworthy on the phone and using black American, you know, like all these things. It's just like, it's impossible to check all those boxes. I think it's, you know, been like a narrative in feminism. It's like, the big yeah, yeah. message from Barbie, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's impossible like, to be a woman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You talked about how it's like if you're a trans woman, like you're presenting something despite, in spite of what people are going to automatically maybe assume about you. And I think like that is a lot of what we're talking about is like the presentation of identity is language and it's clothing and it's all these other things. But oftentimes it's it's that in spite of what might be presumed, um, right? Of like putting, doing that linguistic affect, changing that vowel or doing something like we're saying, a, using particular vocabulary, using particular syntax. That's all it's like, what is this going to, is this going to mask what you are going to presume? Is this going to like amplify or like, is it going to like elevate your position? You know, it's like, do yeah, all like these- let you and you're like, yeah, you and your big titties sneak into this workplace. And yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. it's right. like this thing of like, yeah, like we want you to have opportunities where especially like as educators, it's this thing of like, we're trying to train the next generation of linguists. We like want you to have opportunities. We want <laughs> yeah. everything to do well. We're going to fill you full of knowledge about how language works and then tell, prepare you for the job market <laughs> by being like, throw all that out the window. 
Yeah. You know who you are? Fuck that. We don't like it. Yeah. We don't like, like that. Yeah. We don't yeah, want yeah. it. It's not, it's, we love you, but we can't yeah. hire you because we trained you. So you have absolutely right. no opportunity to work in this community where you've grown. I think you have yeah, to yeah. another one. And yeah. In the movie industry, it's always like, we want you to lose weight, but we just want you to feel your best. So we want you to lose weight. We just want, you know, it's like, what's going to make you feel most comfortable on this film set where everyone's more attractive and skinnier than you, you know, like that actresses talk about that all the time. Like it's, it was just, it's just yeah. a thing of like, oh, I, they just want me to feel my best. And I think with like, you know, with language, I mean, people ask me to stop swearing all the time, but like, I have no patience for that, but just in general, like I, it's certainly you, you hear people that speak, that speak more stigmatized varieties of English than I speak. Let's just be clear. Like I speak white mainstream American English, but like people that don't, it's like always this question of like, well, you know, yeah, I just figure like, I want to, I've talked to, you know, people that grew up speaking a Boston accent and they have this, some idea that like they, they, they want to speak proper quote unquote properly in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Whereas like if they're mm -hmm. at home, they can kind of speak in this like Boston dialect. Um, and that goes for black English as well. It's like, well, what, what is proper and what it's, and you know, and, and then, and then it comes down to this other idea of what's, well, it's like, well, I'm just helping myself. And like, maybe you are, I'm just like aiding and, and giving myself opportunities. I don't know. But yeah, like somehow this idea that it's like the best thing possible for you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not, um, I do a lot of work trying to not vilify that choice, mm -hmm. yeah. like moving towards like more standard varieties. Like it, it certainly makes sense why people do it. And it is, like you were saying about transness, it's so difficult to move past what society is expecting of you as a language yeah. producer. It is so difficult to walk out into the world and do self in a non-normative way, whatever that looks like. And so some people don't have a choice. You know, you might be differently abled. You don't have a choice. Yeah. You have to go out and you know, interface with the built environment that literally was not created to serve you. <laughs> like yeah. physically, factually, it wasn't created to serve you. So people who face that, and who, like you were saying, it is a privilege to like have the choice, who like have multiple styles at their command, face the intense pressure of having to choose a standardized variety and somehow manage to make it all the way out into the world and use their language really authentically. Like I think about Fantasia, who is doing all of this like wonderful press tour for the color purple and mm -hmm. has like a very rich, like beautiful African American variety and doesn't change her language and iota in these, you know, all of these like high minded uh, outlets now want to talk to her. She's the it girl. Mm -hmm. um, and she is like very much not moving, not, there's no linguistic motion there. And I love that you know, but that, that authenticity is so, it's so hard won and it's so, it's so difficult to nurture, um, that that's like part of why I love doing the work I do for the dictionary is that if, if this language has been used long enough for it to catch our ears for us or for us to get notice of it, like at the dictionary. And that means like people have been working, like doing yeah. the work of like putting it out there and using it in like this very authentic and like genuine organic way. And that like deserves to be celebrated. It deserves to be codified. Um, even if that word isn't going to hang around forever, like skibbity, you know, mm -hmm. like that kind of thing is like, maybe it has a shelf life, but it's important and interesting. It tells us something and yeah, it's not easy. It's like, it's like liberatory, like every single time. Like I think, um, one of my favorite things to talk about is, um, you know, if a tree falls in the woods, does it and make no one's noise? there to hear it? Doesn't make yeah, any sound. Yeah. And it, yeah, <laughs> what it, what an arrogant, what an arrogant question to think yeah. that sound only matters if you're there to hear it. That if if the listener, I realize, is empowered in this, you know, cycle of production and perception. But of course, the language that I I can stand out in the woods and scream and I'm still creating a pressure wave. There's still material being ejected. I don't need you to hear it for it to have purpose. I can carve my name on a wall, or press a triangle into a clay tablet, bury it in the backyard. Like all of that kind of production, even my own thoughts, even when I'm hearing someone and I said, oh, I heard a Southern speaker, but I remember that sometimes I think that's less intelligent, but it's not like even that little bit of language use in your own mind is like, liberatory in the extreme for a lot of folks but that space is really hard one of being like this is how I do words yeah. and so like yeah I think 
we can all celebrate that. Like the, we monolinguals, you know, we mainstream language users, right? Like yeah. all of this, because I'm one of them too, you know, um, there's still so much to be celebrated and enjoyed there. Yeah. Um, 